Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Betty Cruz, and I'm the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. It's my honor and privilege to be with you here today for this Foreign Policy U.S. Senate Candidate Forum. I'd first like to turn it over to Erica Owen, Associate Dean of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh, who is kindly hosting us here today. Please welcome Erica. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to those of you who, who are here in person and also to everyone joining us virtually. Uh, welcome to the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm Erica Owen. I'm the Associate Dean at Gispia, as Betty mentioned, and we're very proud to call Betty uh, both a graduate of our program and also to have her serve as a member of our Board of Visitors. Um, so thank you, Betty, and thank you to all the sponsors for organizing this really important dialogue on foreign policy. As the last few years and you know, even the last few weeks have shown us, this is a critically important topic and this is a really wonderful opportunity for citizens to learn about these important global issues and you know, ranging from the topic of climate, immigration, conflict and, and health. So thank you to the candidates um, and thank you everyone for your participation and for being here. Thank you so much, Erica, and thank you again uh, to Pitt and Gispia for, for the space and for being a partner. Um, to everyone joining us online and in person, thank you for being a part of this candidate forum on foreign policy. Before getting started, for folks joining us virtually, locally, or around the world, we would like to acknowledge that today's program is taking place in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples including the Seneca, Lenape, Osage, and Shawnee. Through this acknowledgement, we invite you to join us in paying respect to the, el to the elders, both past and present. I'd like to also thank our partners, Casa San Jose, Comp, Women and Girls Foundation, who have come together with us to host this US Senate Candidate Forum. We know the incredibly important role that the Senate plays in foreign policy, and that's why we're here today. We are honored to welcome Mila Sanina and Monica Ruiz, who will be moderating today's forum. Mila is an independent journalist, a writer, an editor based in Pittsburgh. Until 2022, Mila served as the executive director of Public Source, a nonprofit newsroom delivering public service journalism in the Pittsburgh region. Monica Ruiz is executive director of Casa San Jose a nonprofit community resource center that advocates for and empowers Latinos by promoting integration and self-sufficiency. I'd like to now turn it over to Mila and Monica, who will give us an overview of our rules and format for this conversation. Thank you again. Hello, everyone. My name is Monica Threes, and I'm one of today's moderators. Thank you, everyone, for attending the forum in person and virtually today. We would like to let the audience know that each candidate was invited to today's event. George Bocchetto, Everett Stern, Ron Johnson, and David Hsu all committed and were confirmed for the event. Due to unforeseen circumstances, not all candidates will be attending today. Hello everyone, my name is Mila Semina and I will also be another moderator for today's event. For the rules, uh, we have Mr. Shu. He will be given two minutes, 120 seconds to give an introduction as to why he feels he is more qualified than others to be the next Senator of Pennsylvania. There are many issues that need to be addressed during this uh, forum, and we only have a limited time to do so. We will have a 10 minute break midway through the forum. Next, we will reconvene uh, to gather questions from the public, and uh, some of them, they have been submitted prior to tonight's forum uh, and have, will be submitted on the World Affairs Council Facebook page or Casa San Jose's Facebook page. 
And to all viewers watching from home, please, if you have questions, submit them in the comment section of the World Affairs Council Facebook page or and Casa San Jose's Facebook page. We will close today's forum with Mr. Shu being given two minutes to give a conclusion as to why he feels he is more qualified to be the next Senator of Pennsylvania. Our timekeeper will keep track of time and you'll be able to see the timing of that on the TV screen below the moderator's table. Thank you to the University of Pittsburgh, specifically the Graduate School of Public International Affairs for providing the venue for today's event, the moderators, the staff of World Affairs Council, Casa San Jose, Pump, and the Women and Girls Foundation, attendees and candidates for coming today that came together to make today possible. David Jim, you will now have the opportunity to share a two minute, which is 120 second introduction as to why you feel you are more qualified to be the next Senator of Pennsylvania. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Nancy and I are glad to be here. Nancy came here from China for uh, to get a runaway from the socialism, communism, and get to freedom. And uh, I had some good insults for the other candidates, but I guess I have to keep them to myself. Uh, I'm the best qualified because I was in the Army 30 years uh, and three years at the Pentagon at the strategic level. And um, I worked for General Pace on the Joint Staff. And you have to be invited to be there. That's the highest staff in the entire country. And we are uh, very much part of the uh, power of the United States. The United States is the most successful country ever to exist. And one reason is uh, the military, where we can influence other countries four basic ways, through diplomacy, information, which is speeches, you know, uh, true propaganda, not fake or uh, not untrue propaganda. The military drops the hammer. Uh, we, uh, and also we sell military gear and train our allies and, and partners. And then we uh, are a strong show of force to prevent invasion, or we go uh, give people the gift of democracy like Iraq or Afghanistan or, or try to do that, whatever. But uh, so that's military. And then um, economics through sanctions and uh, trading with countries, recognizing countries, trading, not trading sanctions. So we call it dime at the uh, Pentagon. And the current administration is very weak on this. Uh, I don't know why uh, President Biden keeps saying he's taking the military off the table with uh, the Russians and Iranians, it's really uh, shows weakness. I don't like that. We need to get back to the Constitution and keep America strong. And uh, I'm the best qualified in this race because I was at the strategic level for the whole country for three years at the Pentagon. Thank you. Thank you. Today's first topic will be healthcare. The question is how does our healthcare system compare to those globally? And should we be trying to model our system after that? The second part of the question is, how do we address the racial disparities in the healthcare system? Well, our system has uh, some of the best technology uh, from around the world. And uh, so that's good. We need to get government out of health care. Obamacare was unconstitutional, in my opinion. And uh, we need competition. Obamacare has actually contributed to the consolidation of hospitals, which reduces competition, increases prices. So that's bad. Uh, we have some, some racists in America, but I think that's very much overstated. The systemic racism is a, a, an exaggeration. There's some of that. I'm from the South. I spent 40 years in the South and I can count on my hand the number of racists I heard about or knew. So uh, that's, uh, you know, we have some of those people and we need to punish them, but uh, that's not a big problem. Mr. Shu, now our next question is about housing. Um, the global crisis in affordability for, of housing has gotten even worse uh, following the pandemic. The effects can be seen both abroad and sadly here at home. What moves can we make both as a global community and nationally to close the gap between empty, unaffordable housing and the homeless? Yes, we need to reduce regulation and taxes for the uh, middle income and upper income people because they uh, provide capital for businesses and the younger people provide ideas and labor and that's capitalism has been working very well for 300 years but when the government gets away and perverts this like they're doing now paying people not to work that's a big problem 
Uh, the CDC had no power. It was very illegal and unconstitutional to tell landlords who worked hard for their houses and apartments to live there free for the last two years. That's uh, very unconstitutional. So that would help out if the government would get out of this and start obeying these 30 pages of the US Constitution. That would help a lot with housing. Thank you. The US continues to be one of the only countries not to ratify many environmental international treaties, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity Treaty. The Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants and the UN Convention on the law of the seas. How does this affect our standing in the global community? And do you think we should take a more active role in the global community's effort to minimize the disastrous effects of climate, climate change? Uh, yes, the, uh, a lot of climate change is uh, exaggerated. The uh, United States has done very good with our environment. Uh, the last 20 years or so, the emissions have gone down. That's amazing because population and uh, technology and the number of vehicles has gone up. So we're doing great on that, on the environment. We need to get the Chinese and the Indians to get in on it and stop burning so much coal. Uh, the US government should uh, give no tax money to people buying electric cars. Uh, they, you know, if you want one, buy one, but the people I represent didn't even go to college and they, they don't wanna pay $70,000 for an electric car. I don't know why you, we're taking their tax money and giving it to upper and middle-class people to buy an electric car. It's too soon for that. The government needs to get out of the way on that plus furthermore to build a honda getting 40 miles per gallon takes less emissions than to build an electric car and what are you going to do with the battery in 10 or 15 years it's terrible for the environment a lot of that stuff or exaggerated the benefit ethanol just came out you know for 20 years we've heard ethanol was great and it was a big scam it didn't help the environment much at all maybe not at all but the politicians have been pushing that crap for what 20 some years so we need again to get government out of the way um Today's fourth topic will be immigration. Out of the more than 26 million refugees in the world, less than 1% are considered for a settlement worldwide. The Trump administration decreased the admitted number of refugees considerably over his term to 15,000. And President Biden has just raised it again with the goal of allowing in uh, 60, almost 63,000 refugees in the 2021 fiscal year. Both of these numbers are well below the previous years. And we're hearing about the crisis right now going on in Europe uh, with now more over uh, 2 million refugees out of Ukraine. Do we increase our cap to the IRC's suggested 200,000 in 2022? Or is the US stretching itself too far with that larger of a number? In Pennsylvania, there are over 180,000 undocumented residents that reside within the Commonwealth. In addition, nearly 11 million live in our communities across the country. Pathway to citizenship has been an issue in this country for decades. What is your stance on a path to citizenship? And please explain your position as to whether you support it or are against it. Yes, thank you. We, um, we support legal immigration. My wife came here legally. It took uh, several years and uh, we need young, hardworking people. We do not need um, you know, more people getting welfare. We need to cut that, uh, but we do need legal immigration. But we have 10 million open jobs. We need to cut the welfare and get people, stop paying anybody not to work and uh, fill up these two, 10 million jobs we have now before we get into any of that. And, uh, and if we bring back manufacturing, like it was really dumb in the 1990s, to ship a bunch of jobs to uh, the communists in Vietnam and China and Mexico and everywhere else that devastated people in the South where I'm from. I'm from Florida and Southern Virginia. We need to bring those jobs back. It, it was really stupid. And some of the people, we need term limits. Some of the people who did that are still in Congress. They're sick people. They ruined millions of people I knew uh, or uh, in the South, you know, with shutting down the textile mills, clothing mills, furniture factories. That was really stupid to do that. We need to bring that back and that would help uh, for our legal immigrants to get more jobs and work hard here. Um, we have a criminal justice reform question. Um, despite the fact that the U.S. has signed many treaties ensuring the safety of incarcerated people, there continues to be a trend in the U.S. not meeting the standards put forth in these treaties. 
After many broken promises from Obama to close Guantanamo Bay, the prison remains open and continues to defy its international obligations. Should the U.S. continue to operate outside of the realm of international law? If not, how do we begin to close its doors effectively and permanently? Well, we have, uh, I'm a soldier, so uh, with evil, the violent people, you have two choices. You can put them in prison or destroy them, you know, kill them. Th those are your choices for violent, uh, very committed terrorists I'm talking about, or violent criminals. So Guantanamo Bay was a perfect place for them. They, they don't deserve any uh, protection under the Geneva Conventions. They don't wear uniforms like we do. And they don't, we don't go around killing people for no reason like they do. So uh, that's my stance on that. We need to crack down on criminals. We don't have a big racist problem in America. We have a big uh, criminal problem. We need to arrest the criminals. And a lot of people in these big cities, I'm glad we don't live in a big city right now because they're letting criminals run free. And people are sick of that out in, in middle of America where we come from, coal country in Pennsylvania. So we need to, we believe in second chances in America, but not third and fourth chances, especially with violent people. You need to lock them, lock them up, you know, put them under the jail. And uh, that's my stance on criminal activity. This question is about the wage gap. Women still learn, still earn, I'm sorry, according to our most recent data, 82 cents to the average man's dollar in America and 77 cents international. If elected, how do you plan to act in relation to the Paycheck Fairness Act, which addresses wage discrimination on the basis of sex, which is determined, I'm sorry, which is defined including pregnancy, sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristics, specifically by limiting the employer's ability to defend a difference in wage by anything other than strictly job-related factors? Uh, yes, we believe in um, equal rights. The, uh, that's very important. The, uh, the, I like the Me Too movement. A lot of men, you know, um, you know, older than me, uh, you know, kind of were too aggressive with women and everything. That, that was good that the Me Too movement stopped a lot of that crap, and uh, we should not tolerate that. Uh, treat everybody with respect. Uh, in America, everybody's equal. We don't need, uh, when I went to war in 2003, uh, you know, I, I worked and uh, helped the Kuwaitis, you know, kill the Iraqis and get them out of a Kuwait. And they're, but it's very tribal over there in the Middle East. And I, I told them, and they asked me a lot of questions. A lot of foreigners are very curious about how we live over here. I said, in America, we, we really, a lot of times we don't know our neighbors. We don't give a, we don't care, you know, what religion they are, what color they are, what ethnic group. That's great. They said, really? Over here, a Shia, a Shia and a Sunni and a Jew and a Christian would never live, be neighbors. You know, they hate each other. A lot of them do you know, for thousands of years. So I'm proud of that, that the United States has never traveled, but, but here we have uh, maybe half the Democrats, they want to make America travel on race and religion and all this other crap, income level. Uh, I, I'm not into that. We need to fight that, this socialism, communism, dictatorship trying to be put on America. It's time for us to transition to another question. Thank you. Um, now we are transitioning to the section about international and global affairs. Um, the first question is, how do we combat China's economic coercion becoming bolder and their military budget increasing? Is pulling away economically our best choice? Co cooperating with allies like Japan or a combined approach? How do we deal with the repercussions of pulling away economically from China? Cost to American investors, loss of global competitiveness for US business? Mr. Zhu, where you, where you stand on this? Yes, we, uh, I think when you look at any of the, uh, we have about 200 countries, you need to look at the people and the government. And here, uh, most people are not thrilled about the U.S. government and all this crap they're doing. In China, same thing. And we went to China, my wife, I grew up there. And uh, they told me in private, and they knew I was a, a, an active U.S. soldier who loved democracy and hated socialism and communism. But they will tell you in private in China, they don't like the CCP. It's only 8% of the population is, is a member of that evil, sick party. They'll cut up your arm to stay in power. And unfortunately, a lot of Americans are greedy on Wall Street and the government. They've taken that yuan. They're chasing yuan and selling out America. And we need to stop that, uh, bring manufacturing back here and stop these people on Wall Street and everywhere else investing in China and the CCP. They're emboldening this socialist communist group dictatorship, whatever you want to call it. And like I said, about half the Democrats want that crap here, that system here. And uh, I would have said you were crazy five or six years ago if, if, if uh, you had said that to me. But I will say that to you now as a 
knowing more and more about politics and, and spending three years at the top of the Pentagon, uh, this socialism communism is coming fast here. We better stop it. We better get back to the Constitution. And that's why I'm running for Senate. Thank you. One more question on international and global affairs. After the U.S. pulls out of countries such as Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Syria, are we still obligated to provide fungible foreign aid? How much obligation does the U.S. have in relation to foreign aid to other countries in regards to our current involvement? Should we provide more or less? Well, we need to help arm and train our uh, allies and partners, anybody who uh, shares our dream of equal rights and democracy. But uh, remember, you know, reading history, this is one of the most uh, safest times to live in history. You know, they used to kill you for the what, seven or eight uh, you know, sins. And um, so it's a very safe time to be a human being compared to history. And, uh, but we need to help our allies specifically in Ukraine, uh, months and months ago, they should have snuck javelins and stingers in there to kill the Russians and the helicopters and the airplanes and the tanks, you know, but the Biden administration are weak, you know, during the Obama Biden years, they sent them blankets when the Russians invaded. This time they sent nothing, I guess. I don't know, I don't have access to top secret information anymore, but they should have been arming the poor Ukrainians months ago to prepare for this, this idiot Putin and uh, Russia killing innocent people like that. But history, if you read history, the weak always suffer. You know, you can't be weak. And quite frankly, I'm worried here about supersonic missiles coming here. I don't know if our government's so obsessed with woke ideology. I don't trust them to uh, defeat these supersonic missiles coming out of Iran and China and North Korea coming here. If you thank want to you. talk about defense. Thank you, Mr. Shu. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. If, uh, we will be taking a short 10 minute break and we will be back to resume our public questions section shortly. If you still have questions um, that you would like to ask Mr. Shu, please submit them on Facebook pages of World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh or Casa San Jose's Facebook page. Thank you. We will be back in 10 minutes. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We will be taking, we will be moving on and taking the questions from the public now. Today's public questions section includes concerns from community members and residents from across the state that have been submitted prior to today's forum and submitted live as well. The first question is, what is your stance on the Mexico City policy, a policy rescinded by Biden that blocked US federal funding for non-governmental organizations that provide abortion counseling or referrals? advocated to decriminalize abortion or expand abortion services? Uh, yes, the, uh, that's a tough one. Abortion is a terrible thing, a terrible situation. Uh, I've never been involved in it, but uh, I would not uh, tell anybody, any woman, you know, it's a person or a politician, anybody what to do on that, to do that or not do that. Um, we need to make it, you know, as rare as possible, but, um, that's, that's my stance, that's just a bad, bad situation. Thank you. How would you discourage the proliferation of coal-fired power plants in developing countries? Well, we can, uh, we have a lot of technology with uh, fracking and, uh, and drilling oil and, and, uh, and natural gas. So we can share that uh, technology and, um, and we need to, do more of that here, drill, baby, drill, we say here, so we don't depend on the, uh, the evil dictatorship in Russia and Iran and Venezuela. And uh, I was appalled that the Biden administration sent a secret team to Venezuela to talk about oil this week or last week. That's, that's ridiculous. We, should, we have plenty, we have 100, over 100 years of natural gas and oil here in America. We need to drill that up and, and use that. But we should help our allies and partners, you know, uh, get off coal or at least get the clean burning coal. Please address the expansion of presidential power to begin and end wars. For example, why was the president able to withdraw from Afghanistan without congressional approval or oversight? Well, that uh, question is uh, wrong. The premise is wrong. That was a surrender in Afghanistan from a weak, corrupt 
administration and president and vice president Biden and Harris, they killed 13 of our brothers and sisters for no reason. They gave up Bagram Airfield for stupidity. People need to be impeached or go to jail for that. Uh, we were over there, what, 20 years in Afghanistan, and uh, that was long enough. We can help these people, but we can't go around rebuilding countries around the, the earth. No country can afford that. And our country is, what, $33 trillion in debt. We need to look out for America rather than re rebuilding these little corrupt villages in Afghanistan. The next question from the public is, uh, please speak to the threat of a nuclear armed Iran and North Korea. How should the US minimize the effects of these threats? Uh, yes, we should uh, use our military, the uh, special forces and uh, sanctions, um, use our allies, uh, Israel uh, helps out a lot with that to uh, make sure that the evil Iranian mullahs never get a nuclear weapon uh, and uh, you know, contain these people like North Korea, who, uh, you know, they already have some kind of nuclear weapons. It's debatable on the quality of that, of those. But, uh, you know, we need to contain that and uh, just uh, keep a strong military in America to deter anybody, uh, any bad actors thinking about you know, developing a nuclear weapon, like the Iranians. Do you see Brexit and changes to the Irish border changing the nature of our relationship with Ireland? And if so, how? Did you say Ireland? Yes. Uh, I'm not, uh, it's been a while. We went to, to Ireland one time a while back, Nancy and I, but I'm not uh, too familiar with the uh, specific issues of that country, you know, at this time. Next question is, what do you think about our relationships with the rest of the Americas? And what's your vision on how we can experience a new intercontinental reality between North, Central and South America? Yes, we need to quit flying down to Cuba like uh, Obama did. That was ridiculous to support a socialist communist dictator killing people and impr imprisoning families. Uh, we need to promote democracy and freedom and equal rights and uh, not the woke issues, but uh, just stick to freedom and equal rights and uh, strength. Uh, what America made America great, you know, promoting three equal branches, uh, fighting corruption, uh, helping them arrest these uh, bad actors, dictators trying to stay in office forever, you know, getting elected like Chavez, and then uh, just lying to get elected and uh, then abusing their people. But uh, we can't, cannot be policemen of the world, but we have Southcom down there. That's, we have, uh, you know, several uh, combatant commanders in charge of US military operations around the world. And one of them is Southcom. So we help uh, train and equip uh, our allies down there to uh, kill the terrorists and and promote democracy, you know, and equal rights. But it's a uh, freedom, uh, peace is uh, really, you know, we're spoiled here. Peace is normal in America, but it's abnormal in many, many, many countries. Uh, Thank it's you, not... it's time for the next question. Mm -hmm. How do you plan to help alleviate the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan while simultaneously ensuring that the lives of American troops are not necessarily put at risk? Well, we can try to help the you know, one side or the other in Afghanistan, and not the Taliban, they, they are brutal, evil killers. So uh, we can help them help man and train, you know, the, the better groups over there. But sometimes it's a question of the uh, which bad actor is least bad, you know, in, in a lot of places. So, but we don't need to be, uh, you know, trying to build nations in, anywhere. They're, they're very tribal over there. Like I was saying, people trying to make America travel like this this stuff going on in other countries, like in many African countries, but uh, in Afghanistan, same thing. It's very tribal. They have very little allegiance to any corrupt or any federal government in Afghanistan. DSA took a firm position on NATO this past weekend, urging the U.S. to withdraw and end imperialistic expansionism. That's the quote. Do you agree with anti-NATO rhetoric, and do you disavow their statement? Well, we support uh, NATO, you know, 100%, but they need, uh, we've been telling, even when I was at the Pentagon in 2006 and, until 2009, we were just begging the Europeans, the weak socialist Europeans, to spend more than 2% of GDP on their 
military, you know, it's like we're, we're still protecting you. Why is that? You know, the Germans make a fortune around the world selling great cars and technology. Why, why are we defending them? You know? So Trump was right on that. He made them pay a little bit more or quite a bit more. So that was good. But uh, the, this uh, notion of uh, bringing Ukraine into the NATO, uh, I don't support that right now. Uh, the Ukraine, Ukrainian people are hard workers and they're fighting for their freedom and God help them. But uh, the government is uh, very corrupt and uh, it's, a, it's a poor country. We had 500 Ukrainians in my unit when we gave democracy to Iraq and we had them in Kuwait with us, 500 Ukrainians. And they were awesome, they were hard workers, but they were very, uh, it's a very poor country. They had really ratty equipment for World War II and we helped them, we helped uh, equip them and man them and train them for the war uh, in 2003 when I was over in Thank the combat zone. So. it's time for the next question. How much aid should the United States provide to Ukraine and still avoid a potential all-out war? Well, like I said, the Biden administration should have been arming and uh, training and equipping the Ukrainians for years ago, you know. Uh, so that was a failure on the Biden administration. And, uh, but we do need to keep doing that, you know, uh, clandestinely and, uh, you know, getting arms in there so they can defend themselves. Uh, you know, they deserve that. Uh, I don't support a no-fly zone, you know, over there that, that they need to stand up. We, well, we should help the Ukrainians, you know, defend and kill these Russians invading for no good reason. Ukraine was not a threat to Russia. Ukraine was not a threat to anybody. It's a very poor, corrupt country. So uh, there was no excuse for Putin to go in there. He's just a sick, uh, demented dictator. Next question is, what is your platform on expanding TPS, temporary protected status, to people from the countries on the TPS list, such as Venezuela and Nicaragua? Well, we need to help... Uh, other, you know, uh, legal immigrants, not illegal immigrants. We need to stop that, finish the Trump border wall. But uh, we do need to help people around the world, the world, you know, with equal rights and freedom and support, you know, good people. And America has done, helped more people around the earth than any other country in the, since the beginning of time. So uh, we've done a lot of that. Americans, are, most Americans are Christian and very charitable with their time and money and everything to foreigners and, uh, and Americans. So we need to continue that. But uh, but like I said, we need to cut the welfare and get the, fill up these 10 million American jobs open right now. Uh, there's been an attack on the capitalistic system by uh, about half the Democrats now trying to get people to stay home and not work. That's sick. That's, that's part of capitalism. You know, we need cheap, you know, labor and, uh, and capital to, to have capitalism. That's, that's the whole reason we have a defense. You know, our whole national defense is based on our economy. These people in D.C. are attacking our economy when they attack labor and making people lazy and stay home and not work. Thank you. What type of politics are planned to be introduced supporting Latino immigrants that contribute with taxes, payments, and work in the United States? Can you say that again? I didn't yes. understand. What type of politics are planned to be introduced supporting Latino immigrants that contribute with paying taxes, and working in the United States? Well, we need to uh, support anybody who works. Uh, we love the workers. And um, the, but the people coming here illegally, that needs to stop. And, uh, and you know, the, the criminals need to be deported or at least in prison. But we love legal immigration, not illegal immigration. There is a question from a community member who submitted uh, their question in Spanish. What type of laws can be implemented for an inclusive United States where immigrant lives are respected and improved as essential workers? The, uh, you know, uh, up until the last uh, I don't know, 30 years, it was enough in America to Agree on this: the Constitution and the Bible, really, or the values in the Bible and the Constitution. That's enough to be an American. You know, we don't need to agree on everything. That's the beauty of America. That is America. So uh, we need to help everybody. But uh, I think uh, English should be mandatory, really, for anybody coming here. Uh, you can't have a country with, you know, many different languages. That's that's tribal. That's tribalism. And there are what uh, about seven thousand languages on the earth. So we need English as a that's a language requirement here. That, that is our national language. It should be, that should be the law. This is also uh, submitted by a community member. It was originally uh, submitted in Spanish. 
what can we do to make healthcare more accessible for that for the Latino community? Uh, we need to create competition, get government out of health care, get rid of Obamacare and all that. Uh, that's just a bunch of, you know, welfare and uh, create competition with the hospitals and doctors and uh, have independent, awesome doctors like we had, you know, 20, 30 years ago before Obamacare. That would help out and have competition and uh, open pricing. The Trump administration tried to force these hospitals to print all their prices. And, and, and many of them have not even complied. They've uh, just taken it to court, I guess. That's, that's not right. You know, to have surprise bills, you should know what, what it costs to go to, to the hospital, you know, mostly. Mr. Shu, what is your stance on public K through 12 education as it stands today? Is the education that students receive conducive to succeeding in an increasingly globalized America? Well, we need to go back to 1950 or 55 where no government employees should be allowed to join a union. They're totally unnecessary. In the South, we don't like unions much. We can tolerate them with private businesses. They are un totally unneeded for government employees. They have plenty of protection, plenty of local, state, and federal laws protect government employees. And we need to fire the bad ones. The unions hooked up with the CDC and, and, and are still keeping a lot of children in masks. This totally uh, goes against the science. Uh, and we need to get rid of unions in the government because mostly a lot of union, I'm not attacking union workers, a lot of that, I know a lot of them, they work hard, but they give part of their check every week to corrupt union bosses and corrupt Democrats and rhinos too. And that creates huge wasteful abuse of government. We need to cut back our governments way too big and controlling. In your opinion, what is the level, if there is one, of disaster or war overseas that should require the U.S. to get involved? Well, through diplomacy, information, military, and economics, we can, uh, we need to promote and maintain stability in all the regions of the earth, you know, that's in the U.S. national security interest, in my opinion. Uh, so we need to do that. And um, if, uh, you know, we have horrible dictators like in Cuba or uh, Venezuela or wherever, North Korea, we can try to uh, you know, help those people. I think we owe it to, to help, you know, let everybody, everybody wants to free, to be free, like uh, Ronnie Van Zant said when Leonard Skinner, but uh, so we should uh, help that. That's what America stands for, you know, uh, equal rights and freedom, democracy. Beyond upholding the Constitution and your prior service, was there a specific moment that inspired your run for public office? And what was it? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, you'd have to be crazy to talk to strangers about politics or religion, I'll tell you that. And uh, if the voters, I found out a couple of things. I've learned uh, voters are angry and they're brutal, you know, with their criticisms. Some guy told me I had a big head the other day. I said, wow, I didn't even notice that before. Thank you for that. Uh, but uh, so it goes back to we need to break up big media, big tech, and big companies, you know. And John Adams and George Washington warned about this. If politicians get in bed with big business, we're screwed. That will not be a democracy or republic. Or, you know, this is a republic. Uh, so the, when I was, wa I was watching golf, I like golf. I was watching the golf channel and they started criticizing uh, President Trump. I said, what, what is going on? I just want to watch golf for goodness sakes. Like, what is this? And then I figured out Comcast, those horrible Democrats in, in Philadelphia own NBC Universal, own NBC, own the golf channel and Sky News too. So they can feed this fake propaganda lying about Trump that he's racist. I've never heard him say anything racist. Uh, and a lot of Hispanic love him. Thank you. It's time for the next question. Is there going to be any legislation that allows undocumented immigrants to obtain a form of ID, like a state ID or driver's license? Uh, well, illegal immigrants need to uh, you know, come forward and, and become legal. If, if, if that, that's my opinion. But we need to stop illegal immigration and go with legal immigration. That was the last question that we received from the public. Now, Mr. Shu, you have an opportunity to address the audience and have two minutes, uh, 120 seconds to conclude and tell us why you feel you are more qualified to be the next Senator of Pennsylvania. Yes, thank you for having me, um, Betty and Olivia and everybody. And uh, thank you for having Nancy and I. If you can, I need signatures to get on the ballot. That's what I'm trying to do now. Go to davidshu for senate.com. If you can sign my petition, I need them by uh, this weekend. 
2,000 signatures, but we're just normal common people. We're in the middle class. I, I never wanted to be rich or anything. I just wanted to be in the middle class. So uh, that's where we are and we're happy. So we need normal common people in DC. These people in DC don't give a damn about small business people like Eric right here I just met. Uh, they're in bed with the big business people, the S&P 500 companies. A lot of them are woke, pushing, pushing this woke, woke nonsense. And it's not good for uh, most Americans. And that's why I'm in this race. I'm the best qualified. I was in the Army 30 years, airborne, combat duty, uh, on the Joint Staff, Army Staff at the Pentagon. And um, I know how DC works and how disgusting the politics are there. And, uh, you know, for instance, I worked on the budget one year at the Pentagon. We asked for 30 airplanes. I think there were C-17s. The idiots in Congress gave us 50. And I said, hmm, why did they do that? It's because they had a bunch of union jobs in uh, 50 different congressional districts. And that's been going on for 200 years. That's one reason this country is heavily in debt. And uh, we need to really destroy socialism and communism here. It's five other places, not here. That's why I'm running. Thank you. Thank you to you, to the University of Pittsburgh, specifically the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs for providing the venue for today's event. The moderators, the staff of World Affairs Council, Casa San Jose, Hump, and the Women and Girls Foundation and attendees that came together to make today possible. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>